Well, hello everyone. This is Al Fadi, and you're with us here in a very, very, very special live stream. I know we do a lot of special editions on Sundays, but this one is more special than ever. Uh, as you can see, of course, uh, the reason why my guest, uh, the way he's dressed up, can tell you a whole lot about. Uh, how special this occasion is. I've been now advertising for this occasion for the last week uh, or so. I gave many hints that my guest is going to be from Saudi Arabia. At least we can say someone who was born and raised there like me. And today uh, he is a servant of the Lord. And, um, you know, I remember my journey to Christ. Uh, it took about 12 years of people reaching out to me, witnessing to me, planting seeds. But, uh, you know, the first time I left Saudi after graduating from college, I heard for the first time ever something about born again believers. And that was strange to me. And it took, like I said, a journey of 12 years to finally get it. And it was in November of 2001 that I accepted the Lord. But the funny part is, I thought I was alone, the only ex-Muslim who accepted Christ and the only ex-Muslim from Saudi who came to know the Lord. But the Lord was so gracious to me. First, he introduced me to Arab Christians. And then slowly and gradually, I ended up connecting with the other believers from the Gulf area. And then finally, with believers from Saudi. And finally, I connected with my brother here, my brother Nasser, as you can see, Nasser al Ghattani. Uh, in 2015. And uh, it is uh, my honor and my privilege to introduce to you our dear brother Nasr al Ghattani. I'm going to let him share a whole lot about what he does in his ministry in due time during the interview. But I can tell you that he is a former jihadist. He's a former jihadist who now serves Christ with zeal and he serves Christ in full time by making disciples. And I love his teaching, by the way, and his desire to help the believers grow and mature in their walk. He loves to equip the church and he loves to preach the word of God. Let's stop right here. I turn it over to my brother. Brother, welcome. Oh, thank you, brother. It is such a joy and an honor and a privilege to be with you here tonight. And I, I as you know, I my story is very similar. And for a long time, I thought I was the only one also. And it was a blessed, blessed day. I still remember that almost five years ago when I was introduced to you and and they told me you were from Saudi. And I was like, wow, what? From my country. And I actually met a, a sister from our country that same day too. And I remember um, you know, calling my wife in tears, like, it's happening. It's happening. The thing that we prayed for for so long, like our people, are coming to know Jesus. Amen. Amen, my brother. I love your heart and I love your wife's heart. You guys are true warriors for Christ. So brother, take your time, you know, uh, let's enjoy this time. There's a lot of people that have been waiting for this and a lot of people that have been praying for this and a lot of people who will be encouraged by this. Yeah. Share with us your journey, you know, how did you grow up? You mm -hmm. know, what was it like when you were a Muslim and you know, what, you know, open the door for this discussion about Christ and, and just, just your journey in ways that will help people realize the challenges and also the easiness of reaching uh, people like ourselves. And just for, for, for the records, uh, you know, Nasser comes from the eastern region of Saudi. I come from the western region. We're the nicer guys, you know. And they're <laughs> <honest. laughs> There's a little, little bit of rivalry between the east coast and the west coast. Yeah. yeah. So um, how was it like growing up? Right. Uh, you know, I, I grew up, in the, as you said, in the, the eastern coast of the eastern province of Saudi Arabia. Uh, you know, not, not a lot of people know that, I think, outside the region. Uh, you know, people tend to think of Saudi Arabia as, you know, 100 percent Sunni Muslim. Right. Um, most people who know anything about Islam know there's another uh, a faction group within Islam. Um, Shiites, Shia people, uh, and there are quite, a, it's a minority, but a sizable minority within Saudi Arabia who are Shia. And in the eastern provinces, actually, where many of them are, um, but the city that I, I grew up in, um, Al Jubail, was actually sort of like the, the Sun, one of like the Sunni strongholds within the Shia region. And, and we took pride in that. And I remember growing up, 
you know, this being reinforced, not just by, by within my family, from my father uh, in, in school um, and, the, and the preaching on, on Fridays um, in the mosques, that we had to hold the line. We had to be the best of Muslims. Um, sort of like nobody used this language, but almost I could say in, in Christian language to witness to all the, these, these Shiite people around us that maybe they might come and, and become Sunni also. And, and so I just remember from that very young age, this being impressed upon me that, that people are watching you, they're watching your life. And, you know, of course we're as Muslims, we know, we know that God is watching, there are angels watching, everything you do is being recorded. Everything you do is gonna be weighed, judged on the last day. And, and so all this pressure, what do you do as a young person? Well, you, I thought oh, I'm gonna do my best. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to live a perfect life. I'm gonna try to whatever the best things I can do for God, uh, I'm gonna do them. And that, that included, you know, as uh, you know, I grew up in the, in the 80s, um, in Saudi Arabia, and uh, there was a war going on at that time in Afghanistan. And it was, we considered it a holy war, that it was Muslims fighting non-Muslims. And as I was hearing the preaching and, and teachers at the time, I remember from, I'm talking, I'm in elementary school, and I thought, wow, you know, if I die for Allah in jihad, like this is like the best thing I could ever do with my life. And so, from a very young age, I thought, okay, well then that's what I wanna grow up to do. I wanna grow up in some way. I wanna be able to, to lose my life, give my life for God and for my religion so that I can do the best thing for him so that I have the highest guarantee, if there are any, that I could be in paradise when I die. That was my childhood. I know. It's amazing, brother. You know, I tell people about this and, and they, they think we're joking, but you know, I don't know how we felt about it, but I had this, eagerness actually this mm -hmm. this this willingness to like my life meant nothing to me actually i felt yeah. like so excited about doing it you mm -hmm. know was it was it the same kind of emotions absolutely, absolutely brother i i every time i i hear you share your testimony I, I feel this i i relate absolutely to that and i know that and and i think that's what's hard for people you know outside the region to understand is is you and i were actually not an anomaly you know, the fact that there are today, uh, you know, uh, very dangerous organizations, um, terrorist organizations coming from, that are, are filled with leadership from our country and they're actually from our generation because there was a whole generation that was brought up this way and, and taught to think like this. And we're, we're, sadly, the world is reaping the fruit for the things that were being preached and taught to us when we were young. I know. So what happened uh, when, when you decided that this is the path you want to take? Um, how did you uh, go about trying to do that? Right. So, uh, you know, I, I tested the waters a little bit with my parents. And, you know, I had some friends, you know, I, I was, you know, 12, 13 years old. I had some friends that were a little bit older than me, 14, 15, 16 years old. And some of them were already like getting permission from their parents. Uh, to leave the country, go into Pakistan, get trained by the Taliban there, and then go into Afghanistan and, and fight in jihad. And so I would sort of like bring up the topic like, oh, my friend Yasser, he's, he's gone. He's went to go do this and see what my parents thought. And, you know, my parents thought this was crazy. My mother especially, you know, oh, you know, I weep for his parents that he went and did this thing. And so I thought, okay, my, my parents <laughs> are not going to be on board. Uh, with my plan, so I can't I can't share it with them. So what I started doing is talking to some people that I knew, and again, like I'm 12, 13, almost 14 years old, and I'm making plans to sneak away from home, get smuggled by a human trafficker over into Pakistan <laughs> to get trained how to shoot a gun, so that I can then go over the border into Afghanistan and and fight the Russians. Right. I mean, just crazy. I think about it now. It's like ludicrous um, kind of thing. But that was the plan that I was making. And uh, God had other plans for me. Amen. Amen. So um, what was your family, by the way, uh, like uh, from your perspective, were they so devout like you or were you probably among the few in the family that felt that way? Uh, within my immediate family, I would say I was, I, tr I at least thought I was the most devout. 
I mean, I I was in the mosque praying, you know, as uh, as often as I could, you know, you know, even the the early morning prayers. I was just couldn't wait to get out of bed and and rush to pray, uh, you know. During you know, we just ended the Ramadan during this time of year. Like when I was growing up, like I would spend half half my time in the mosque, like I just wouldn't leave. I would just sit there and just reading mm -hmm. the Quran over and over and praying and praying extra prayers, just trying to do all that I could. And and the rest of my family wasn't quite that extreme. But but like I said, like I, I the message I was getting are these are the things you must do in order to please God, in order to have a chance at uh, yeah. eternal life in paradise. And so I'm whatever I got to do, I'm going to do it. Amen. And did you have, I mean, like in my case, my friends were the ones who were encouraging uh, me. They were the encouragers, mm -hmm. you know, and, and uh, some of them went, some of them were saying, oh, you should do it. You know, at least I don't know if they went or not. They were chicken probably, but, but nevertheless, <laughs> yeah. some, some did it. Some wanted to encourage me to do it. In your case, did you have any immediate close network friends that were on board with what you're doing? I, I had a few that absolutely knew what I was planning. They supported it. They were ready to to lead, to do the same thing with me, we were going to do it together, and uh, you know, and I was actually one of, in my circle of friends, one of the ones who was actually encouraging others who were more on the fence, like, no, you should do this. You know, are you a real Muslim or not? Right? Do you want to, do you want to be in heaven or not? Like, this, this is what you got to do. And so I was actually one of the ones putting peer pressure uh, on some of my, you know, my closer friends. And then what happened? I mean, did you um, try to find a way to go, like you said, to Pakistan for this training? Right. So I was all set up to go. Um, I, I had a plan, all of that. And it was the, the summer of 1990. And, you know, my mother is, is originally from the United States. And so she has, you know, had a lot of family there. And so every few years, my dad we, would take us back to the U.S just to see, let my mother see some of her family visit, all of that. And we just so happened that our scheduled time was that that summer. And so we went and I have planned as soon as I get back to back home, I'm going to implement this plan. And right at the end of the summer, when we should have been going back to Saudi Arabia, Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait from Iraq. And now we have this war in the Gulf. And right. you know, as you said earlier, that's that's where I'm, I was living, was in the Gulf, just south of Kuwait, um, really uh, not a long drive away, definitely close enough to the action that, you know, Iraq, you know, was was launching missiles into Saudi Arabia. One of those missiles hit not only in my city, but close to my neighborhood, close to our home. And so suddenly we were like, you know, travel shut down. We were trapped in the United States of America, <laughs> which you know, in my mind was the great Satan. I'm like trapped in Satan's kingdom and I can't get home. And now what am I going to do? How am I going to die in jihad when there's, you know, when I'm stuck in, in the middle of the U.S.? And uh, that just totally disrupted my plans. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. That was those were really sobering times, especially the fact that, of course, uh, to have someone who is the leader of Iraq that supposedly was part of the union, the Arabic basically coalition, a friend, you know, a neighboring nation invade you. It kind of like sent like these wrong signals everywhere and everybody began to watch their back. It's like, what's going to happen next? Who's next now? You know? And I remember the government of Saudi tried to, uh, to take like proactive measures just to prevent such an idea from taking place because the, all the signs were right there. Right. And that this guy was crazy enough to do it, you know? Right. And it was so odd because, you know, uh, we were so used to, like, you know, there, we had the war in Afghanistan. It's easy. Who do we root for, right? We were rooting for the Muslims when Iraq and Iran were fighting. Like, we know who we root for. We root for Iraq because those are, the, even though it's a majority Shia country, it's ruled by a Sunni. So we root for him. Like, we want them to win. Correct. But now a Sunni nation is invading another Sunni nation and going to war with another Sunni nation. You know, like what in the world is happening? Like it felt like the end of days, like everyone's going crazy. And it was very hard to make sense of it. Right, so what happened? I mean, uh, obviously part of your family was still there. Uh, so yeah. uh, what, what happened at that, at that time when right. this invasion took place? So, you know, my father was, was still in Saudi. 
my my mother and myself and my siblings, I'm, I'm the oldest, we were stuck in the US. And so I, you know, suddenly when I was 14, instantly became, you know, tried to become the man of the house, take care of my family, take care of especially, I was really concerned about my younger brothers and sister. Like if we ended up becoming trapped in the US for an extended time, I was really concerned that they might become corrupted by their time in America. Like I felt secure for myself that I was, you know, strong Muslim. I wasn't going to be tempted or swayed by, you know, the satanic influences of the culture of America. But I was really concerned for my younger siblings. And so I, I started to become like the that we have the, the Mutawwa in, in Saudi, you know, the religious police. I was like the religious police in our house to make sure, like, even though we're not in home, you gotta pray your prayers and at the right time and you know, I want to see you, you know, continue to study the Quran and all that. I wanted to keep them all um, very pure. And as time went on and it became clear to me that we weren't going back home anytime soon, uh, I, I really went through a little bit of a crisis myself because I didn't want to be in America. I was OK to come and visit, see things, be reminded why the Saudi Arabia is such a blessed country by God. Everybody knows the right religion you know, kind of gave me like a little pump of, uh, you know, self-righteousness before going back home. But I didn't want to be, I didn't want to live here. I didn't want to be trapped here. And I began to wonder, you know, what, what is, why is God allowed this to happen to me? Doesn't he know I was ready to give my life for him? Why, why has he sequestered me in this evil nation? It was very difficult. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I want to welcome, of course, everyone uh, to this uh, special edition of uh, Let Us Reason with me here, a dear brother in the Lord and of a special guest uh, from Saudi Arabia. Uh, he's a former Muslim like myself, a believer in Christ and a servant of the Lord. His name is Nasr al-Ghahtani, as you can see. And of course, we uh, thank our moderators for the wonderful job they're doing. And we encourage all of you uh, to uh, leave us questions we're paying attention to the questions of course periodically we will interact with those especially if you want it for my brother here but let's keep it also respectful uh and i assure you that we're not here to antagonize anyone i know some made comments about our dress we're dressing up this way uh, for a special region, uh, reason, of course, we are both from Saudi and we want to honor our culture, of course, but also we want to show that the Lord is working in a powerful way, even in the least expected areas. We're not here to uh, cause any trouble or antagonize anyone. In fact, we welcome any questions from our Muslim friends. And uh, this is, you know, uh, a wonderful opportunity for you to interact, not just with me, but also with another brother in the Lord from Saudi. So, so what happened next, brother? I mean, I remember, you know, when, when the war between Iraq and Iran took place in the eighties, I was excited. You know, I felt yeah. like, you know, the Sunnis are going to decimate, you know, the enemies of Islam. But There'll then when no Saddam more, yeah. invaded, you know, uh, yeah, when Saddam invaded Kuwait, it was confusing to me. It's like, you know, yeah. what's going on here? So did, right. did, did, did that really play uh, any factor into your thinking? No, you know, I think at the end of the day, the, the conclusion I came to, which is the conclusion I think most of the world came to, was that he was a crazy guy. And I decided, well, he must not look. This is sort of typical, like we all fall into. When someone from our group behaves in a way that we can't accept, we we find some way to, to remove him, in our minds at least, from that group. So suddenly I stopped thinking about uh, Saddam Hussein as a Sunni Muslim. Like he's not a real, he's not a real Muslim. He's not a real Sunni. And therefore, there, there's your explanation why he's behaving in this way, why he's leading his nation in this way. And, and that was sort of how I, I, I reconciled that. Yeah. So um, what was next, brother? What, what, what happened after that? Well, you know, you're, what are you going to do? You're trapped um, in the U.S. You're surrounded by infidels. And, you know, you, got, you have two choices. You, you either have to, you know, start a, a war against them or you, you have to bring them into Islam another way. And I decided, you know, that I wasn't prepared to start jihad by myself against America. And, you know, and I also, you know, I don't know how you felt about this, but, you know, the United States really stepped up in Saudi Arabia to defend our country in the, the Gulf War. That's right. And so I kind of felt like, well, maybe... God is going to bless them for that. And then I, 
it shows you like the, the incredible amount of, of self-righteousness and pride I had, even as a young man, that I thought, well, maybe God has brought me here as one of the best Muslims <laughs> has brought me to America so that I can evangelize them so that I can lead. I, I just had this image in my mind. There was going to be this great harvest of Americans flocking to Islam and America was going to become a Muslim country and, and all of this. And maybe like I, for such a time as this, here I am. I, I, can, I can communicate well with Americans. My English is good. I can explain Islam to them in a way they can understand it and accept it. And so I decided that's this must be God's will. This is what I'm going to do. And so I began to basically evangelize for Islam, uh, you know, to, you know, uh, my fellow students and teachers and neighbors and everyone that I came into contact with. And, you know, a lot of people just thought I was crazy. Uh, but I did start to see over time and, and my dad actually blessed what I was doing. Um, my dad heard, you know, I shared all this with him and with some of my uncles back home. And they said, oh, yeah, I think this is God's will for you. And they began sending me, you know, uh, books and, and, and audio cassettes to listen to that try to train me in Islamic apologetics. And so I kept practicing and practicing. And as a, the more I, I practiced, uh, the better I got. And I started to see some fruit from my efforts. I started to see, you know, regular American people, you know, born and raised. Um, some some are born and raised in the church, some born, you know, outside the church. But but abandoning their prior beliefs and, you know, becoming Muslims. And I thought, OK, this this is my destiny is is to be here and, and preach Islam. And so that's what I did for several years. Wow. You know, I remember when I was uh, trying to witness about Islam, uh, at least my hope was that I would bring people to Islam because, you know, the value of setting captives you know that's the way we think about it that they mm -hmm. are slaves and you set them free and right. therefore now they're entering islam and you are going to get mansions in heaven but uh, yes. in your case you did get those mansions <laughs> i thought i was oh my i thought i was like if my my pride level was here once i started to see americans renounce like and some of them you know like i said grew up in the church so they were renouncing jesus as their savior and that's something i i carry a lot of of um pain with me to this day about that that they were renouncing jesus and and becoming muslim and at the time i thought i'm like there's no what no i don't know of anybody else that's doing this and having this kind of success and so i thought i was fantastic yeah. Now, I mean, it's interesting you mentioned this, by the way. Um, uh, next week, uh, I will have a brother who uh, converted from Christianity to Islam and then 12 years later left Islam and came back to Christianity mm -hmm. as a born again believer. Now, did you ever in the course of your discussion with some of these, of course, in our mind, all Americans at least were Christians or maybe some Jews, right. you know, and even if they say they're atheists, in your mind, okay, so they were Christians and they claim there is no God, but it doesn't matter. Did you ever hear anything about born again believers? Because that's really the the, 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 the alarm bells, you know, basically start ringing in my head when I heard this. A couple of yeah. times, like, what is that? I mean, who, who are these people? Right. I, I don't know. I Like, I want, I, I it's, pro it's possible that, that somebody used that language. I, I never picked up on it if they did. You know, Christians were... Uh, like, like you said, I thought everyone in America was, was Christian, you know, America is a Christian nation. So that in my mind meant everyone that they're American, they're Christian. And, you know, based on the things that I saw coming out of America and the media and, and all of those things, I thought, okay, this is what Christians do. They, you know, sleep around, they love to drink alcohol and do drugs and worship money and all of these things. These are all, you know, Christian values. But I, I did start to see that some of these, you know, Christians uh, lived differently than the rest. They, you know, they didn't use foul language. They, you know, didn't allow, they didn't permit themselves to, to watch or listen to things that I thought were unholy. And they were very, you know, uh, thoughtful, kind, loving. And I didn't understand what was so different about these Christians than than every everyone else. And, you know, I, I was really drawn to them because of that. Like, I thought these people are so close. You probably had the same thought when once you met. These people are so close to Islam. If I could oh, yeah. just get them to drop this wrong thinking about 
the prophet Jesus, like it would be, that would be great. They would be great Muslims. And, and so those are actually the people that I tended to focus on and try to have, you know, religious conversations with were these people that I saw that were, were living their life differently than the culture. And, you know, they did use a lot of language that I didn't fully understand. Um, the, the born again thing wasn't something that stuck, stuck out to me, but what did stick out to me is not so much what they said, but how they lived their life, how they spoke to me, how they, they were respectful towards me, even when I wasn't the same, honestly, like I, I would say, I look back very disrespectful things about their beliefs, very disrespectful things about the Bible and their view of Jesus. And they still, most of them were extremely loving towards me, extremely kind towards me. And that caught my attention. Amen. Now, you know, uh, b before we continue here, just a quick question, if you don't mind. Uh, being in the East, uh, you know, in Saudi, uh, did you come across Westerners, given that it's close to the oil company and oil fields and other things that were taking place? I remember in Jeddah, you mm -hmm. know, I only met with like two British families. That was it, you know, but... Um, not as the, as much as when I went to Aramco to visit some of my friends and cousins and where I met a right. whole bunch of them, of course. Right. Uh, you know, uh, Aramco is, is very close to where I grew up. And, you know, my father worked uh, in the oil industry. And we, I didn't know a few Americans, but we weren't really very close to them. Uh, you know, uh, like I said, I, I had such a high standard um, for myself and that included who I spent time with. And so I wasn't really interested in spending time with people, you know, who weren't Muslim. I wanted to be around other Muslims. And uh, yeah, like I just, I had no, no interest in a relationship with them. I hear you, brother. I just uh, want to make a quick comment. Uh, I, I'm speaking to the moderators. There is this Sam Weller, who has been making a lot of annoying comments. So please put this person in timeout because we don't need these antagonistic uh, comments right now. We're focused on being positive and we don't appreciate that kind of stuff. All right, brother. Uh, so what happened after that? You know, now that you're in the US, now that you're right. witnessing, you're bringing people to right. Islam. Did right. that, I'm sure you felt so excited probably about Very. that and you felt like you're doing the right thing, you know? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, I thought I was so wonderful. That I was, I could, I felt like given enough time, and if the person was intelligent enough, <laughs> I could win anyone to Islam. That that's that's what I thought. And so what happened was because of that arrogance, I uh, met a wonderful Christian woman that I fell in love with, and I decided, you know what, I'm going to marry her, and I'm not even going to wait for her to become a Muslim. I'm gonna marry her while she's still a Christian. And after we get married, then I'm gonna you know, start putting the pressure on her. And actually it'll be harder for her to leave anyway. And so I can put that pressure on her and she'll become a Muslim. And that was my undoing. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I mean, I remember uh, I had the same thoughts uh, and many of my friends had the same thoughts, you know, uh, simply because at the end of the day, you care about your children, right? You know, right. you want your children uh, to, to uh, you know, to be securely, you know, raised up Muslims without any intervention whatsoever. So yeah. how did it go? Tell us about that. <laughs> so, you know, uh, you know, I've had some practice. This wasn't my first time, you know, trying to talk about Islam with an American person who had no background in it, no context for it. And so I, I had learned through trial and error where the hot button topics were. How, to, how like what would be the, the point, like what could I say that would turn them off or turn them away? And so I avoided all of those things while, you know, we were, we were dating and, and then became engaged. You know, when she would ask questions about, you know, my beliefs as a Muslim, I would explain to her just, you know, the basic things that I felt like she needed to know, like Muslims, we believe in, in one God. You know, we believe that God has sent, you know, many prophets. We, we uh, you know, believe Muhammad was the last one. We believe in all the books that God sent before, which includes, you know, the Torah and the Psalms and the Gospels. 
And, you know, and I, I we believe in Jesus. We, we love Jesus. We think Jesus is great. And, and that, that's where I would stop. I, I wouldn't tell her anything more than that. So, you know, I can just imagine from, from her perspective, I was portraying Islam almost like it was an Eastern denomination of Christianity. You know, that's right. not I, far, right? And, and, you know, brother, we were really genuine about our feelings towards Christianity. That's what we know about Christianity. We're not really right. exaggerating. We're not lying. This is how we right. believed Christianity right. is all about. Yeah. Exactly. But and I waited until after we were married before I began to say, you know, but you need to know that the Jesus that, that I believe in, is the things that you say about Jesus are not right. You know, he's not the son of God. He, you know, wasn't an half divine, fully divine, none of that. He was a man, a holy man, but he was still just a man. And he did not die on a cross. God would never allow that to happen to one of his prophets. He, God rescued him. I explained to her the whole Islamic perspective on that. And so I said, you know, when, when you're praying um, in Jesus's name or praying to Jesus, I said, you know, what you're doing is idolatry. You're idolizing one of God's prophets and that's wrong and you need to stop doing that. And, you know, the best thing you could do is become, you know, a Muslim and, and here's all you have to believe in and, and that there's one God and, and Muhammad is his, his messenger and just drop all this extra baggage about Jesus, which I would say to her, you know, you know, it doesn't make sense anyway, like the Trinity and all of this. And, you know, you know, like I would, I would do it in a, such a subversive way, like, you know, there's contradictions in your Bible, like, you don't have to tell me yes or no, like, I know that you know that. And don't you see the Quran is this perfect book, and there's no contradiction in it. And it's a miracle and all of these things and just began to apply pressure, uh, you know, softly at first, but then stronger and stronger um, as time went on. And it put, uh, not surprisingly, a huge strain uh, on our relationship, on our marriage. And yeah, like she began to wonder like, what, what have I done? And, and marrying this, you know, super devout Muslim. What do, you think, what do you think was going on in her mind? You know, uh, 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 her friends probably uh, during the dating period of courtship or whatever, you know, were they influencing her to uh, move away? Did you feel any tension at the beginning or was it after the marriage that she began to question her decision? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, her, her family was a little concerned with for the right reasons, the name, right? for the, when she told them the name of the guy that she was dating, like, Oh, I don't know about this. Where's this guy from? You know, who is this? Right. And then they, they weren't really uh, excited about the marriage. And then after the marriage, they were really weren't excited when they began to see how it was, trying to influence her. And I, I, I know that there were people in her life, Christians actually in her life that said, you know, you made a mistake. God's going to forgive you for, for marrying this guy. You know, the Bible says you shouldn't be unequally yoked. Um, you know, God would forgive you if you just divorced him and just forget about this guy and start a new life. And that didn't sit right with her. And she loved me. And God spoke to her um, actually through a message that was being preached at, at her local church that, you know, what she had done was wrong and in, in marrying a non-believer, but God could still work in this situation, but it was going to be hard. And we had um, an aunt who First was Peter a missionary. Yeah, maybe. Exactly. And she had an aunt who was a missionary for uh, decades in Brazil. And her aunt said to her, you know, you may end up waiting 20, 30, 40 years for Nasser to come to Christ. Are you are you prepared to take on that burden of interceding for him, of praying for him daily, of being a, a witness and a light for Jesus in your home, no matter what it costs you? Are you willing to accept the consequences of, of the decision that you made? And, you know, her answer was, yes, I'm, I'm in it. I'm, I'm, I'm in it. And she began to not only pray for me uh, daily, but she began to mobilize hundreds and then thousands of people, of believers, to intercede for me on a weekly basis. She got a whole mega church um, in North Texas praying for me. And then when we moved to Missouri, she got another mega church there to, to pray for me by name week after week after week. 
um, that God would reveal himself to me, that he would reveal the truth to me. Amen, brother. Amen. And by the way, I want to um, make a mention, uh, Muhammad Ibn Jars, congratulations for making a decision to enter into the kingdom and follow our Lord, brother. And Sam Shamon mentioned that to me. We were delighted. Bless you, brother. We're here to serve you in any way, shape or form. Brother, yeah. how did your family react to you when you uh, were exploring the idea of marrying, of course, an American, you know, in their right. mind, of course, they know she's Christian, but right. but how did they react? Some families are okay. Other families, sure. I don't want to make it like a blanket coverage here. Right. Some, uh, some families can go really nuts. I mean, Al-Ghahtani, it's a big, a big tribe, and I know they probably didn't like the idea <laughs> of, right. uh, of having an American involved in the genealogy, right? For sure, for sure, and... You know, I I know that, you know, my marriage had already been semi arranged from when I was, you know, young of, of who, you know, my first wife would be. And you know how it we don't have to go into that. But, you know, uh, as, as you can't gather more wives, you know, sometimes you get a choice, sometimes you don't. And it's about it's not about you. It's about what's good for the family. But, you know, unfortunately, you know, my dad couldn't say a whole lot to me. At least that was was my feeling because he set an example. He married um, an American woman. Now, my mother, uh, even though she was born and raised in the U.S., she became a Muslim right. um, before he married her. And and so she, he still married a Muslim woman. I, I went a step further and marrying an American who was still a Christian. But again, you know, I if anyone said anything to me, I'd be like, come on, like, how many Christians have I led to Islam? Like, back off. I know what I'm doing. I'm, you know, I God, God is with me. He's guiding my steps. This is going to be great. You know, you can pick my next wife. That'll be fine. You know, but this one, this one's for me. Next wife. All right, man. I like your thinking. Okay. So I know, you have a terrible. lot of people here that are going to be taking some uh, ibuprofen right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. You got married. She's questioning now her decision, as she right. should, actually. I'm sorry right. to say this. I mean, oh, by yeah. the way, I know her. She's a wonderful, godly woman. So yeah. even I look at her like, well, what were you thinking? You know? Right. But uh, but of course, we praise the Lord for that. So Amen. so did that add to the tension, add to the tension between the two of you? Or did oh, you just ignore sure. the fact that she's thinking this no. way and she'll get over it? Yeah. No. Well, you know, when I when I met her, you know, outwardly, she seemed like a pretty nominal Christian. You know, she wasn't attending church anywhere. I didn't really see her, you know, she didn't really pray a lot in my presence. You know, uh, you know, her Bible was usually on the on the bookshelf, you know, not, you know, in her hands. And so I really thought this is going to be an easy conversion. But, you know, as I began to challenge her faith, in trying to bring her to Islam, what I actually ended up doing was was pushing her into a position where she really had to make a, a choice of, of whether Jesus is really her Lord or not. He's either the way, the truth, and the life, or he's not. Like she, she had to make that decision. And so in my pressuring her, it actually kind of forced her to, to hold stronger to Jesus, to kind of cling to Jesus. And then I watched her behavior begin to change as she did that. I, I watched as she began to attend a local church, as she began to, you know, intentionally, you know, read her Bible daily. You know, she's, she's, I see her praying daily. And at first I didn't like this, but then I thought, you know, she's just kind of exploring more of the religion that she was raised with. And I know that there's no life there. And so I know that's a dead end. And so I'm going to let her do that, sort of spin her wheels. And then as she kind of discovers all the problems in Christianity, as she's now really walking in it more, it's going to be that much easier for me to then take her and, and bring her into Islam. And so that's sort of what I was, was waiting for um, during that time. So how did she take that resistance on your part, of course, and at the same time, the pressure uh, coming from you to, to move to the other direction? Right. It was so hard on her. I mean, we had so so many you know conversations that quickly turned into arguments that quickly turned into heated arguments and usually ended you know in tears um especially for her it was so so stressful so so hard and you know i i look back now with you know such sympathy for her her strength 
and and clearly the Lord was with her and strengthening her daily to be able to endure all that pressure. And she's, you know, like I said, she's praying for me in earnest, and she is is gathering other people to to pray for me um, consistently. And from her perspective, she's not seeing any result. You know, I'm, I'm just as hardened to the gospel. I'm I'm still just as certain that that I'm right and she's wrong as I was on on the day that we met. What she didn't know and, and couldn't know is that inside me as as you know one year of marriage turned into two years of marriage, you know, now two years of all of this prayer for me, that there was a real, you know, battle going on inside my heart. And I was feeling I've heard I think I've heard this from other Muslim background believers. I was starting to feel like spiritually attacked in a way. I don't I don't know if you ever, you know, experienced it's like thoughts coming into my mind that I I never mm -hmm. would have thought about. And I later learned that these were actual verses from the Bible that were just coming into my mind, things I had never read. To my knowledge, nobody had ever shared them with me, but but these these um, you know verses and these pictures from the Bible were coming into my mind. Things like, you know, you know, Nasser, what you're what are you doing when you're going down and and prostrating yourself before God and you're praying and and doing all of these things, uh, you know, for God, you know, and God's not a fool. God sees all. God knows that when you come up from that, when you rise up from your prayers, all the wickedness that's inside you is still there. Nothing's changing in you, mm -hmm. and and your all your good deeds are like washing the outside of a cup, but it's not touching the inside. The inside of this cup, your your life is still just as dirty and in need of a cleaning as it was before you did any of these these good deeds. And what are you going to do about that when on the day of judgment you have to stand before a holy God and give an account not only for the things that you did outwardly. But for all the, the junk that was in going on inside you, all of the, the secret sins, the hidden things that you think you got away with because nobody else knows about it, God knows. And he's not mocked. These are the types of thoughts that were coming into my mind. And it wasn't so much pushing me to abandon Islam or pushing me to become a Christian. What what I now know is the voice of the Holy Spirit, what he was doing was he was just simply showing that, you know, if Islam is true, you who think you're the best of Muslims, actually, you're not that great. And actually, you're as deserving of hell as anyone who's ever lived. And so, you know, good luck with with trying to cover up all of your sin with all of these good works. How many how many prayers does it take to get into heaven? Like what is it? A hundred thousand? A million, right? Where's the threshold where you think your good deeds are in going to obligate God who made heaven and earth and everything in them that he should he should be obligated to allow you into paradise? Like nothing. There's nothing you can do to indebt yourself to him. And I started to feel like I'm the one that's in debt and I'm only becoming more in debt the longer I live, which was incredibly uh, difficult for me emotionally. Amen. And brother, you know, because I know, uh, you know, major part of your story, I'm, I'm, I'm just salivating for the next part now. So, so, you know, share with us, uh, what steps were taken, uh, by your wife, at least at this stage. Mm -hmm. Right. So again, outwardly, I look like just as a devout, secure, you know, Muslim man, as I ever have been, and inwardly, I'm I'm all you know torn up. Uh, I'm I'm at war with myself because I feel like I know what the truth is, and the truth that I believe in is now condemning me. And so, what hope is there for me? And I became so depressed. And uh, no one knew this, um, but God and myself, and began to wonder again. I started to drift back to you know the lessons of my childhood and think, you know what? The only help for, hope for me is to die in jihad. That's it. To die as a martyr. I, and, and I started to think, like, how could I do that? Where, what, where would be the the simplest, easiest way that I could get myself killed for God without hurting my family? That was where my thought process is. And by this point, you know, we had our first daughter was born, 
and I, you know, thinking about her and, you know, it, it was just so, so difficult. And in the midst of this, uh, you know, my wife finally, you know, felt like it was time to invite me uh, to, to come to her church, which, you know, I'd always been resistant to, not interested in that at all. And she just felt like prompted that she should invite me. And she did. And I said, yes. And she was, I think, probably surprised by that. But in my mind, I already felt so condemned inside. I thought, you know, what's what's the harm? Like, I'm curious what goes on uh, in these Christian churches. And so, you know, if I'm going to go to hell anyway, I might as well find out what they do in there. And, and who knows, maybe God would bless me and allow me to convert somebody in this church to Islam. If I find someone who's <laughs> open-minded, I know you can relate to that. And uh, oh, man. Yeah, so I did. I went to church and, you know, we can get into that, you know, in a little bit if you want. But, you know, I, I, I thought it was the most satanic stuff I had ever seen an American Western church just for culturally just so different. Right. I had no context for the things they were doing and why they were doing them. But I was so drawn at the same time to keep coming back because of the love that I experienced there from the people. And I thought I was sort of in disguise. You know, I, I didn't dress like this. I dressed like an American. And so I thought, you know, it's a big church. Nobody here knows I'm a Muslim. I didn't know they were all praying for me. And so I thought they'll just assume I'm a Christian too. And I can just sort of spy on what they're doing here, maybe get some good pointers on how to share Islam with, with Christians better from attending. And so that was where my mindset was. But, but week after week, I was being exposed to the gospel uh, in a very real and, and deep way. And so every week was another opportunity for the gospel to come. And, and now the gospel, it wasn't just my own life challenging me and the truth that I believed in challenging me. Now the gospel was challenging me week after week. And the Holy Spirit was challenging me week after week. And also, why, why, why will you not even consider the claims of Christianity? Why are you so quick to, to dismiss all of it, all, all of this stuff. And finally, after several weeks, I reached a point where I thought, you know what? I, I, I feel so torn up. Maybe I don't know what's true. I know that God knows the truth, even if I don't. And so if God holds all truth and he can reveal any truth to anyone at any time, I'm going to pray and ask him to show me what the truth is. And, you know, as a Muslim, when you pray a prayer like that, you don't really expect anything like, you know, I'm not a, who am I? I'm not a prophet. You know, God doesn't care about me really as an individual. He's not paying attention to some little prayer in my heart. But but that's what I, I was so desperate. I did it anyway. It was like reaching, you know, drowning person. You reach for anything floating in the water. And so I, I reached out. And as soon as I had, you know, that that silent prayer in my heart, you know, God, you know, revealed to me this whatever the truth is, I want to know. And I want to know it from you. I immediately had a vision. And so what that was like for me is so I'm sitting, you know, in the probably the, the very back of this church and the pastor's preaching and I'm not listening to him anyway. I'm tuning him out. But then suddenly everything that was before me was wiped away. It was gone. And it was like I was transported to this rocky hill looking down at a man who was so had been so brutally brutally beaten if i knew him he was unrecognizable to me and he was wow. being killed to a piece of wood to a cross and i knew somehow i knew that this is is isa ben maryam this is jesus the son of mary that is being crucified in front of me and i thought oh my goodness is this what god this this really the truth <laughs> was he really crucified and why and why would god allow that like all these thoughts going through my mind and I watch as he's as the cross is lifted up and he's he's on the cross hanging there, bleeding, struggling for breath. And I'm just watching him. And I look at I look him in the eyes. I look him in the face and I see that he sees me. He's looking at me and he's not just looking at me. He's looking through me. He he sees all of my junk, all of the, the hidden things in my life. It's all laid bare before him. And I feel this wave of shame and thinking he must feel so disgusted by me. I feel like God is looking at me right now. I'm, it's like almost like I'm on the last day and here's my whole life being weighed by Jesus while he's coming on the cross. And yet he's looking at me not with disgust, which is what I expected. He's looking at me 
with this fierce love that, that is he's he's fighting for every breath on the cross as if he's fighting at least in part for me and i didn't understand what what that meant or or how that could be but i knew that now that i was i was not just looking at a prophet being crucified i knew that in some way god was present in that man on the cross amen and what he was doing there wasn't about him amen. it was about me and i watched as this darkness after several hours this darkness began to cover everything and it was like it was being gathered up around him and it was it was as if all the 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 darkness the sin that was in my life that was in you know all of, of humanity was being gathered up and being placed upon him while he hung there on the cross and i watched as it was as it was being put on him it, it wasn't overcoming him he was overcoming it he was breaking its power he was nullifying it bit by bit by bit until there was nothing left and and i watched was he cried out that it that it was finished and then he seemingly died there on the cross in front of me and i thought what in the world now because how can god die and then i i heard his voice very much alive saying to me the reason i did this was because you and all the people that were meant to be my children were snatched away from me and you sold yourselves to other powers and to other rulers to other kings and to get you back to bring you back to myself to buy you back this was the cost amen and this was the price that i amen for you for all of you, but for you, Nasser. Amen. Amen. But you have to choose yes. whether you will surrender yourself back to me, whether you will give yourself back to me now. I have made a way for you, but you have to choose to take the first step now. And then as soon as he had said this to me, the vision like was suddenly gone. I'm still I'm suddenly seated in the church again. I, I missed the rest of the sermon. You know, I missed the, the closing song. I even missed the invitation. But this the, the pastor of this church, God bless him, um, he wouldn't dismiss the congregation. Every week, he, he, this was his habit, he wouldn't dismiss the congregation without giving people one more chance to surrender their life to Christ. So he would just ask everyone uh, to bow their heads, close their eyes, and he'd say, if you want to receive Jesus right now, nobody else is watching but God. You can pray this prayer after me right where you are and Jesus will hear you and Jesus will rescue you. And I found Amen. myself in that moment with my head bowed, my eyes closed and these words coming out of my mouth that I never, 20 years as a Muslim, I never thought I would say these words, confessing Jesus Christ as my Lord, as my God, as my savior, asking him to forgive me, to wash me clean, to accept me as his son and as soon as i prayed that prayer and it i was so nervous because i thought other people might hear me and but nobody heard me not even my wife who was sitting next to me heard me nobody knew what, what had just happened but i immediately felt something almost like a fire fall upon me and i felt as if i was just wrapped up in this amazing presence that was just pure peace and love and belonging. It was just the most amazing thing I had ever felt. And I knew that was God's response to my prayer that he said, yeah, you can be mine now. You belong to me now. I have marked you. And uh, I, I was born again. <laughs> I don't know even at that point in my life I had ever heard that, that phrasing or not, but for sure on that day, the man who walked out of that church was not the same man that walked in. And it changed my Hallelujah, life. brother. Hallelujah. Amen, brother. Of course, I understand, you know, and uh, I remember the day when I got baptized, brother. I mean, I never cried tears mm -hmm. like I did that day. I mean, it's almost like it was cleansing me from the inside out. And we yeah. praise the Lord for that. So 
Um, uh, your beautiful wife is here, by the way. She's doing a side discussion, you know, answering questions. You know, they're they're asking questions, and she's stepping in. And then and they ask her if you beat her, if you beat her as a Muslim, she defended you. So I'm I'm glad I'm glad she just stood up for you. So brother, and there I were say, things though, happening. Fairness, I wasn't physically abusive, but I was very emotionally abusive, and I put a lot of pressure on her and trying to to make her become a Muslim and you know things that I've had to ask her forgiveness for and and repent of yeah of course brother I mean that's even worse and uh, I know, I know. Uh, but but again I want people to understand uh, you know what Nasser was doing what I was thinking about doing I mean we felt we're serving our God you know mm -hmm. I mean it's not like we're doing it because we want to be mean people in fact if you ask Nasser in those days he will tell you because I love my wife that's why I'm doing what I'm doing because I want her to become a father of Islam Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, sometimes people think like there is a mean spirit behind it. Well, well, today we know that, but back then we weren't thinking along these right. lines. Right. So, brother, tell us a little bit, if you don't mind. I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot, but what was happening behind the scenes also through your wife's own ministry to bring you to Christ, the prayer and things like that that were taking place? I think people will be encouraged to hear just maybe a fraction uh, of that. Well, you know, um, my, my wife knew that, that if I was going to come to Jesus, it was going to take a miracle. And she knew that for if she wanted to see a miracle, it was going to take a lot of people praying. And so she wasn't content to just ask people at her church to pray for me. She, she was out there recruiting people to pray for me. If you, you know, smiled at her at the grocery store, she was going to introduce herself. She was going to ask if you, you knew Jesus as Lord. If you didn't, she was going to share the gospel with you. But if you were a Christian, she was going to tell you about her situation. Say, hey, I pray for my husband, Nasser. He's a Muslim. Uh, here, let me write down his name because you're going to forget it. That was it. my Here's, favorite part, yeah. you know, writing right. down the name in case you didn't know how to say right. it. <laughs> right. Pray, pray, pray for him. And it was two years of that kind of, of mobilizing. I, 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 to this day, I don't know how many thousands of people um were praying for me but i did after get to meet a few people and they some of them have confessed to me like like nasser we prayed for you but we had like almost zero faith like anyone who knew you like had almost zero faith that there was ever going to be a change because i was just so hard hearted and, and i was you, so you poor. have little faith huh amen amen <laughs> well i mean we we definitely drive people nuts man i mean we come from a very <laughs> background yeah they give up on us you know yeah but yeah. i am so thankful for her prayer ministry of course and she's still yeah. a prayer warrior but but i wanted you to mention that so people know that you know what it's not just talking sometimes sometimes you have to trust the lord sometimes you have to recruit prayer warriors because that's what it takes i mean it takes a lot of labor yeah. and you know your wife has been fortunate to see the fruit and the result of that who knows, brother? I mean, some in, in this situation, let us pray for Sister Jolly. Her husband, his name is Muhammad, who is still a Muslim. She asked him for prayer for him. We pray mm -hmm. that the same thing will happen to him in her lifetime, that she would see her husband embracing the Lord and following him. But, but you, you know, folks, um, at the end of the day, it, it is the work of God. You know, today I preach from John chapter 6, verses 60 to 65, mm -hmm. where the disciples, some of Jesus' disciples, have a hard time listening to him saying, unless you eat my flesh yeah. and drink my blood, you know, and obviously right. metaphorically speaking, and they just couldn't stay with him. And, and the Lord was saying, you know what? It's not up to you. It's whomever the Lord, the father brings to me uh, that will follow me. So it takes the grace of God. It takes the power of God, the work of the Holy Spirit, brother. Right. Well, that's amazing, brother. Um, you know, so what happened? Tell us uh, you accepted Christ. Did mm -hmm. your family find out back home? Did you share with them that they came across it? Right. Uh, somebody mentioned to them. Yeah, so uh, I pretty quickly decided that, you know, I think nobody ever needs to know <laughs> about this crazy vision that I had, that I've decided to give my life to Jesus. I think, you know, it would probably be better for everyone if I just kept quiet about it. I continued to go through the motions of being a Muslim um, just for, you know, all the trouble that could cause, not just for me, but also for my family. But um, fortunately... <laughs> God, God had other plans. And, you know, I, 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 after almost a week, I finally had to tell my wife who still, you know, uh, 
weeping into her pillow every night, you know, praying for me um, to know the truth. I finally had to share with her about my decision. And of course she was very happy and um, she didn't really know uh, the, the culture very well yet at that point, we were still pretty newly married. And so she didn't quite understand that the danger uh, that could happen uh, to us, to me, to my family, if it came out. And so she, you know, thought, oh, this answer to prayer, the miracle has happened. Our prayers have been answered. The church needs to know. And so she began telling people at church, like Nasser's become a Christian now, isn't that great? And so like it suddenly becomes the talk of the church. Oh, wow, we are, the, the God has answered our prayer. And as soon as I found out about that, I thought, oh no, like my life is over now. What's gonna happen? And my family's gonna hear about this. And I just determined, I, I my family's gonna be so ashamed. And, but it would be worse if they hear about this from a rumor instead of hearing about it from me directly. And so now the responsibility is on me. I need to tell them and tell them quickly before they hear about it from, from someone else and have to confront me. And so it's a terrifying thing, as you know, brother, and any others um, who are, are watching this now who have been through this, you understand how terrifying a thing that is. And it is. I, I decided to start with the member of my immediate family that I thought would be the easiest, which was my youngest sister. And so I went and, and shared with her. And, you know, remember, I'm the, the oldest brother and, you know, I'm almost like a second father to her. She really respects me and and tries to live a life, you know, in obedience, you know, to my wishes. And so, I you know, what is she going to do except maybe just reject me? And so... I share with her my story, I share what happened and her eyes are just getting huge as I'm telling her all of these things and I'm thinking, wow, she must think I've lost my mind. Uh, you know, what is she, she must be so ashamed of me. She's quiet through the whole, lets me share the whole story. And finally at the end, she says, um, I, I just have one question. And I said, what's your question? And she said, do I have your permission as my oldest brother to also follow Jesus and become a Christian. Wow. And I just started to cry. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. Okay. And what I what I discovered was uh, that, you know, my wife had been sharing the gospel with her behind my back. And, you know, other people in her life had, had shared the gospel with her. And she was was pretty convinced, at least mentally, that, you know, that Islam was not for her and that Christian, that Jesus offered a better life for her. But she was so terrified of me. My own sister was terrified of what her older jihadi brother would do to her if she left Islam, that she wouldn't even consider making a step of faith. And so finally, that I had been removed out of the way, she felt like a door was open that she could actually make a choice for herself. And so she chose to give her life to Jesus. Hallelujah, man. Hallelujah. It's amazing, isn't it? It's it's amazing yeah. that uh, you didn't know, but somehow the Lord gave you that courage to share with her and look yeah. what you uncovered. Praise the I Lord, know. man. Amazing, amazing. And so then I shared with my my brothers, my younger brothers, um, who were twins, and and one of them, after you know hearing, you know what what had brought me to Jesus and then asking a lot of really good questions, most of which I didn't have good answers to. And I was honest about that, that I, I knew that, that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of God, and he was crucified for our sins. I was like, that's all I know. i still have to learn everything else. I'm a baby Christian, but I know that. And, and he decided that was enough because it seemed to be enough for me. And so he also uh, chose to give his life to Jesus. And then um, his twin brother, uh, decided that I was crazy, I must be brainwashed from my Christian wife or something, somebody cursed me, uh, some kind of, you know, satanic attack on me, something. Like he he didn't want anything to do with this Jesus talk, um, didn't want to have any kind of relationship with me unless I came back to Islam. And, and that was hard, obviously, but it was also the reaction that I thought I was going to get from the other two. So I was mourning the loss of that while still appreciating the fact that two of my siblings were, were now born again. And so then I shared with my parents and, you know, my mother, you know, grew up in America. So she's pretty familiar with, with Christianity and all of that. And, you know, she had a very almost universalist 
outlook on it. Like, you know, Nasser, I think Islam is, is the right way, but you know, you've done a lot of good deeds for God and I'm sure he's going to forgive you for this. And, you know, you just keep trying to be good and keep praying and, and, and fasting and this kind of thing. And, and he'll forgive you for this misunderstanding about Jesus, which of course is not Orthodox Islam, <laughs> but that was the, the attack that my, my mother took. And then, you know, when I, the scariest was my father to share. And I just knew what a disappointment it was going to be for him. And I was actually more grieved about hurting him with this news. I mean, I'm his oldest son. You know, nobody calls him by his first name. Everyone in his life, even to this day, calls him Abu Nasser. That's his identity. And now the, the young man that's his identity has done the most shameful, disgusting, disturbing thing that, that any child could do to their parents. And, and I, I shared with him and he was so hurt, so upset, so angry, but he didn't lay a hand on me, which I feel like was, was God's intervention in that moment. And, and he gave me a, a season to repent where he said he wouldn't tell any of the rest of the family back home because he was still um, living in Saudi Arabia at that time. Uh, and then when I didn't, you know, obviously go back to Islam, then, you know, he couldn't keep the news back much longer and it began to come out. And I, I lost uh, most of my relationships uh, with my family back home. Yeah, brother. Yeah. I mean, you're preaching to the choir, that's for sure. Know, and uh, unfortunately, you know, I want our friends here to realize the, uh, the, the just the, the, the depth of the loss that we suffer for Christ. And uh, yeah. I want them to be mindful of this when they reach out to Saudis and, you know, Gulf Arabs and, and Muslims in general to be gracious and appreciate the fact that they are counting the cost sometimes they're really counting the cost when they are not making the decision on the spot it's not really about checking a box it's about bringing souls to christ and we need to be uh, mindful of that thank you brother for reminding us of this and i just want to once again thank everybody we're, we're going to continue of course uh, you know if you don't mind brother for at least maybe another 10 15 minutes uh, this oh, is of uh, amazing of course we want you to talk about ministry i want to ask you a few other questions about challenges but uh, i want to thank of course the moderators i want to thank everybody for here i want to thank my yeah. uh, my brother islam critiqued uh, thank you so much brother for honoring me once again to come to our uh, live stream uh, and uh, hopefully uh, we will be able to do the same together here soon. Uh, there is a dear brother, uh, his name is Zia uh, Hassan and, and Zia by the way is, is a former Muslim like us and he was kind of like, uh, you know, uh, giving you a shout out saying that your story almost like his. So mm -hmm. Zia, if, if you are really open, Zia, I know you, if you're open to come here and share with us, but bring biryani with you, that's most important for me. <laughs> you put the biryani and you just share and I'll be eating it. Uh, we'll do that. But seriously, if you're open for that idea to come and share your story, I know your story is powerful, brother. Uh, we leave it out, uh, uh, you know, for you to pray about that. So brother, you know, so that happened. Right. Uh, tell me about now your journey with Christ. I mean, right. uh, at, at the same time, you're dealing with the difficulties and the challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you now begin to process that? I mean, in my case, I'm like, oh, man, did I make the right decision? Am I right. being punished by Allah? Because all of it happened within the first three months. But right. I'm thankful for the godly men and women who discipled me, of course. But I right. mean, how did you process all of this? It, it was it was very difficult for me, you know, when as as I started to watch relationships slip away, as I started to, you know, realize all the things that I was giving up, you know, you know uh, possibly giving up the, the ability to ever return home for one, you know, let alone, you know, material things, you know, my inheritance, my place in the family, all of these things that I was giving up, but then also relationships, friendships, you know, that had you know, been a part of my life for, for, you know, 10 years or more that I saw were slipping away. And then also the added responsibility that, you know, I had been a part of leading one of my brothers and sisters to Christ. And now they were going to suffer too, and we're suffering also. And, and what have I done? And have I ruined their lives also? And, you know, all of these things and wondering, you know, like you, you know, when you came to Lord, like wondering if I'm the only one. I came to Christ in August of 1996, and and I didn't know anyone 
um, who was a former Muslim. I, I knew some some Arab Christians and I and I had some that that reached out to me in, in those first few years, but they came from a Christian background and I never felt like they fully understood um, what I was going through and, and how I felt torn because, you know, I still loved my Muslim family. I still love my people. I still love my culture, all of these things. And it was a very difficult the first few years of trying to figure out, uh, you know, who am I now? What is my identity? What 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 have I become? What am I becoming? And all of that. And and the all of the answers ultimately for me uh, were, were found in the Bible that, that um, very early on in, in my, you know, discipleship process. Um, and I, I, I say that with a little bit, you know, of a smile because, you know, there wasn't really any anyone, any person that was uh actively discipling me, even though I needed it and I wanted it, but I didn't know the language for that. But 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 God began to lead me um, to to study the scriptures, to begin reading this Bible that I thought I knew, that I had obviously misjudged in some way, and I wanted to know what it actually said and, and what's the truth that it teaches. And so I just began to read the scriptures starting in Genesis and, and reading through uh, the the Old Testament, reading the Gospels for myself, reading the, the the apostles' letters and so forth. And as I began, you know, to read uh, about the, read these stories, and like I don't know if you had this experience, Abdul Fadi, but you know, to recognize, wow, I for some reason I thought the Bible was a Western book, but actually it's a Middle Eastern book. Actually, like almost everyone in all of these stories. There's stories taking place in the Middle East with Middle Eastern people and, you know, drama within Middle Eastern families that I can actually relate to and understand. And I became so excited about the things I was discovering in the scriptures about God and who he really is. And I discovered that the God that, that I thought I knew that I had grown up with is not the God of the Bible. And, and to see what, what God's love is really like, to see what God's mercy and grace to how the Bible defines those qualities of God. And then to discover my own identity in him. How often, you know, I saw in the New Testament that the words in Christ show up in, re in relation to the position and identity of the believer. And so to, to reflect and meditate on all these things I'm seeing in Jesus can now be true of me as the Holy Spirit begins to, to transform me from the inside out. And as I begin to, to release and surrender more and more of my old identity so that more of Christ can live in me. And it was just so amazing. And what, what I quickly, what everyone discovered around me is I couldn't shut up about these things. Like I just couldn't help it. And so I'd be, you know, going to work and I'd bring my Bible with me because I just wanted to read my Bible during my lunch break and other breaks. And, and then people see you with a Bible at work here and even in America, and they think you must be weird or you're a pastor or something. And so then people are coming and asking me Bible questions and religious questions. And so before I know it, I'm leading Bible studies at my work <laughs> and, and seeing people come to Christ, you know, just through me, just presenting the gospel and just, just the simple way that I understood it. And, and that, of course, you know, God was working through all of that. And one thing led to another. And, and before long, I, I, I began to be actively, you know, mentored and discipled. Uh, by the pastor of our church and began to have opportunities to lead Bible studies at church to occasionally, you know, preach on Wednesday nights and then occasionally on Sunday mornings. And, and yeah, God just began to develop that, that teaching gift in me and that passion to uh, illuminate God's word and, and to make it accessible for people and to help people to understand it, uh, especially in its Middle Eastern context. Amen. Amen. Again, I want to give a shout out to all of those who gave through the super chat thank you so much a, a shout out for somali christian tv i found out right now that you are a former muslim as well would love to connect i would yeah. love to connect of course uh brother um you know uh, each one of us have a calling each one of us has a style of doing ministry and sometimes sadly sometimes people to try to develop their own opinion about how ministry should be conducted right. now what is you know your style of teaching, for instance, or style of ministry? How will you describe that? In other words, right. 
apologetics is part of the Muslim wiring. They're going to ask you the tough questions. They're going to want to argue with you. Right. What is your style of handling this? Because I want people to be exposed to a variety of ways. I mean, I know my style. I like to do it in a certain way. How do you handle it? Right. You know, it, it would have been really easy for me because of you know, the, the life that I lived as a Muslim and I was sort of like you wired for apologetics and practiced like Islamic apologetics, you know, on the other side, it would have been really easy for me to slip into that same role on the other side now. Right. And, but the Lord did not give me any permission to do that. And I think he knew that I probably would have enjoyed it for all the wrong reasons. Um, instead, what he challenged me to do was the thing that was going to be harder for me which was rather than than try to argue people into the kingdom, um, rather than try to win people through information, even even truthful information, and not that I don't obviously I preach the Bible, so I'm preaching truth all the time, but primarily to practice an apologetic of love, to to love people, to love especially people who um, may not like me very much, may not like the the life that I'm living now and and the stands that I've made. Uh, but to love them anyway, just as Christ loved me when I was preaching against him. And so that that's sort of the, the, the path that God has led me on. And, you know, we, we all have different roles in the body of Christ, different, different kingdom strategies that, that God is executing um, through the body. But that's, that's, that's the, the road that he has paved for me to walk. And, and in that, you know, he's made it really clear that he doesn't want me to, you know, build, you know, a, a big ministry around myself or even my teaching, even though I, I love to teach the Bible. But, you know, my my main goal in, in making disciples and in teaching the scriptures is not to get a lot of people to follow me, but instead introduce as many people as I can to this Jesus who has so radically transformed my life and just be, I'm almost, I feel like the middleman, just, just almost like the, the matchmaker. I just want to get these two together, Jesus and whoever this other person is that God has placed in my life. I just want to set them up to get to know each other. And then just let, I just know once they fall in love with Jesus, I can, I can step back and, and let him work and let him, uh, begin speaking to them. And so when I'm teaching the scriptures, I, I even though I have a gift for that, I want to get people excited not to hear my teaching, but to read the scriptures for themselves and, and to get excited about opening up their Bible and getting alone with the Lord and listening to the Holy Spirit as he is the ultimate teacher. Amen, brother. So um, just for the benefit of those, uh, if, if you folks can hang out for another 10 minutes with that, that would be great in case, you know, you're wondering when we will be closing. I mean, I would love to go on for hours, but I want to respect <laughs> the brother also and his time. So, uh, brother, so t t tell, tell us a little bit about, you know, the type of ministry you do. And, and I'll leave it up to you to decide what details you want to share. But what sure. is it that you're doing now? Now, I would tell people uh, Nasser uh, is a computer engineer. OK, a software, you know, in, involved with, the, you know, computer software, ar ar artificial intelligence and, and those kind of things. So uh, all that to say is I want to show you that Christ comes first in our life. And I yes. just want the brother to tell you about the sacrifices that he made for the sake of serving the Lord. Go ahead, brother. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I had a, a great career in, in software architecture uh, for many years and was, you know, serving the Lord also at the same time and doing a lot of of ministry on on the side and and taking a lot of uh you know mission trips and, and that type of thing and about three years ago the lord asked me to lay all that down uh and it was a lot easier than than laying down um islam was for me it was actually one of the easiest choices i ever made was just to uh submit everything fully to god including my finances and all of that and just begin uh uh, I hate to say, you know, full time ministry, like it's a career because that's not how I look at it. It's a lifestyle that's, you know, about and you know, this brother, like it's just about trusting Lord uh, to provide for you and just a, a new uh, measure. And, and uh, you know, we all have to trust the Lord for our to be not just our our provi provider, but to be our provision. 
And so, yes, I've been doing that for three years. And, but even before that, I was, you know, travel a lot, you know, as, as God invites me into places, both all over North America, but then also overseas and Europe and the Middle East and North Africa. And, you know, I, I feel pretty comfortable in saying, you know, I don't really know what I'm doing, except I'm just obeying the Lord as he invites me into things, uh, as he uh, gives me, you know, as I pray and, and listen and try to be an obedient son, he, he shows me places he wants me to go, people that he wants me to speak to, people that he wants me to invest in. And I just try to walk that out in obedience and trust that God is going to do something with that. And, and all glory to him. I've just seen an amazing fruit everywhere that that I've gone with him. I've seen you know, many, many Muslims coming to Christ, which gives me the wonderful, just beautiful experience to be the older brother in the Lord, the spiritual father that I always wished that I had, you know, 25 years ago when I came to Christ and, and to be able to be that for others and watch uh, as, as I just teach people, you know, to obey Jesus and, and to walk in their identity as sons and daughters of the King, to watch them grow and, and watch that accelerate and develop in them. And then to watch them go out and to begin to make disciples also as they fall so, so passionately and contagiously in love with Jesus that they can't help themselves. I mean, that's for me, this is the, the, the greatest thing I could ever be doing with my life. Yeah. Uh, you know, brother, um, I, I want to ask this question, if you don't mind, uh, because we have some funny people here uh, that always like to raise this argument. So when I told people that I'm a follower of Christ from Saudi, I was accused that I was never an Arab. I was never a Saudi. <laughs> I was never a Muslim, oh, you know, yes. and the list yeah. goes on and on. Do you yeah. deal with these kind of, uh, you know, funny arguments? Of course. Of course, all the time. Yeah all the time. And so, you know, I don't know about you, but I, I keep a couple of photos of myself back in Saudi. You can tell I'm in Saudi that on my phone that, you know, when I'm in, in, in face to face conversations with people, I, I pull them up and say, you know, come on. I'm, I I'm for real. So. And, and, you know, brother, just to help those who are doubters, are we the only two Saudi believers? <laughs> Not even, we are such a tiny fraction now. Praise God. Praise God. Praise you know, I, I got the opportunity even this week to, to hear new testimonies from people who have come to Christ, who, you know, both uh, overseas, you know, here in the West or, or even back home in Saudi Arabia. You know, there are people like us who are following Jesus faithfully, trusting him every day. And it is an amazing day that we live in. More and more of us um, are, are coming into the light. Amen, brother. And, you know, uh, I've, I've always been privileged to uh, serve the Lord with my brother here sometimes at conferences, and then he has his own Bible study. I now started, uh, you know, a small Bible study as well. We have people that we both know. We are working towards even doing more stuff together. One of those, a possibility, and of course we say the possibility because we believe that we need to continue to pray for the Lord's guidance here to do a live stream Bible study, at least on an average, maybe once a month. We don't want to make any promises yet, but we're telling you, join us in prayer for yeah. things like this. Brother, any last minute things you want to share with us? And also, I would like for you to also leave the uh, wonderful people who are uh, following us today and watching this, or even those who will watch this live stream later on, uh, any advice, any anything you want to share with them? You know, the there's a lot of people who claim to have the truth. Everyone who has, you know, any belief system, whatever religion they claim to, everybody thinks that their way is right. Everybody thinks that they have the truth. But what I learned, you know, is that if God is the ultimate source of all truth, then the best one you can go to, like I, I say this to Muslims all the time, don't, don't become a Christian because I became a Christian. Don't even become a Christian because of just something that you, you see or, or hear from me. Seek God. Ask him to show you. If you pr pray and ask him sincerely to show you and lead you into truth, he's going to respond because that's actually what he 
what he when you're actually praying a prayer according to his will he wants to lead people into truth but he's not going to force anyone he's not going to to pressure you even though he has all the the strength and power in the universe he's not going to force you to submit your life to him even after all that he has given for you but he will respond to the sincere prayer of god please just guide me into what the truth is show me yourself where the truth is that's that's what i did i wasn't looking to leave islam i had no desire to leave islam i would have probably at the time would have told you I, i'd be happy if someone could just help me to feel like i'm a better muslim so that i don't have this this torment going on within me but when i asked god to show me truth he showed me jesus crucified and and that was the truth that i needed to see and believe in order to be saved. And I believe that God is doing that already. Um, for many people has done that, um, for others both since my time and, and even before me. And I believe he will continue to, to guide people um, into his truth. Amen, amen. Brother, um, how can people follow you? Where can they go and watch you for instance? Instance, and sure. if they want to give towards your ministry or give to you, how can they either do that or connect with you to discuss things like this? I want to make sure we are a platform for blessing you as well. So thank you, brother. Anything you want to share, that's entirely you know in your court right now. I don't want to sure. volunteer info that not so sure if you wanted it to be out there or not. No, it's okay. I'm I'm quite all right with that. I I have a, a YouTube channel that right now I, I've been live streaming twice a week. Um, some some Bible teaching, been going through the book of Esther and now Daniel. Um, you can either search for me, you know, with my name, Nasal Gathani, and I'm I'm the number one thing that comes up, I think, um, on YouTube right now with my name. Praise the Lord. Um, but you can also uh, just go to the URL come and see dot church, and that will also take you to my YouTube channel. Amen. Amen. And of course, uh, can they connect with you directly through those uh, channels Absolutely. if they want to ask you questions Absolutely. and things like that? Okay. Absolutely. Great. I want to encourage you folks because we are accused usually of doing this to make money. My brother left a career that makes him six to seven figures probably. So I don't know what he was thinking when he left that career to do this, you know, because apparently he wasn't he wasn't happy with the money he's making, right? You know, he want to make more. <laughs> no. so he lives by faith and we want you to bless him and uh you know uh, these sacrifices are are real these sacrifices are genuine these sacrifices uh show how much the lord is the number one in our life and that speaks of course for both of us and many of you in here i cannot judge everyone i don't know all of you but i know some of you who've been through a lot of sacrifices well, thank you so much, brother. Um, I would like for us to close by praying for our nation, for mm -hmm. the Saudi people, and for our just, uh, you know, uh, everyone who is laboring among them as well. Um, can you give us the honor of doing that? Sure. Yeah. Hmm, Abba. Holy Father, we I thank you so much for who you are and that with all that you have, you searched us out you rescued us my brother and i we weren't we weren't looking we weren't looking for you we thought we knew you and yet you came you searched us out you found us you marked us and you called us to yourself through your incredible audacious love Lord, I pray that you would continue to do the same thing, but multiplied for all of our people back home in Saudi, God, and the, the diaspora of, of people from our country that are that are all over the world, God. And I know that, that many are finding you out, outside uh, the kingdom, Lord. But Lord, I, I pray that they would not only know you, but they would fall radically in love with you that they would surrender all to you and be transformed from the inside out, God. Lord, I, I pray for, for all of the, the Muslim people, God, and especially um, coming off of, of this month of Ramadan, God, and so many have spent the last month just earnestly seeking you, trying to please you, God. 
And I pray that you would visit them, that you would pour out your love upon them, that you would show them that, that the hard work has already been completed on their behalf and the person of Jesus, that the door is open, that, that whoever wants can come to you now, can be born again, can be receive new life now and eternal life in the age to come, God. Lord, I, I just pray a blessing over, over everyone in the, it's been in the chat, everyone watching live, everyone watching this after the fact, God. Lord, let, let them today, let them even now have a moment with you, Lord. Let them feel your presence. Let them know not only that you are real, that you exist, but that you desire a relationship with them, God. You want them to be close to you. And you have shed blood in the person of Jesus to make that possible. Yes, Lord. And I testify, Lord, that, um, you know, it's my heart desire, my brother's heart desire here for our people to be saved. We can testify that they are zealot, but their mm -hmm. zeal is without knowledge, Lord. So, Father, we pray that you will open the eyes of the blind and just touch them by the power of your Holy Spirit so that they come to, come to know you, the only true Savior, in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Thank you, my brother. What a blessing, what a blessing. And I hope this will be the beginning of uh, more uh, to come in terms of teachings and uh, other things that will be a blessing to uh, the people in the kingdom and blessing for our believers, uh, uh, brothers and sisters who are laboring and who have sacrificed also to come to know him. And I pray for all of you who are here that you've been blessed through this. Please share this testimony with the people you feel like they need this kind of encouragement and the workers and the laborers who need to know that God is at work. Thank you, my brother. And thank, uh, you, thank you, everyone. And yes. until we see you again, and by the way, I have a couple of announcements, maybe while I have you here, guys. Tomorrow, I have a very special edition about the psychology, the psychology of jihad that manipulates the minds of young Muslims, unfortunately, giving them the impression that they are going to heaven. And we want this to be a show that will help you uh, pray for them and labor hard to work with those who assume that there is a way to heaven by shedding their blood when, in fact, the Lord have shed his blood already. Mm -hmm. And we have, of course, our dear brother, Alex Bla uh, Blagajevich, who will be doing another series with me on Wednesday uh, regarding why we trust the Bible. On Thursday, I have a, a special brother that I ask him to come in and join me to talk about certain approaches to uh, for apologetics among Muslims. And on Friday, we have Robert Spencer, who will be with us as well. And on Sunday, next Sunday, we'll have another special edition with Michael Westerfield, and we will be talking about the psychology of Islam. He talks about his conversion to Islam and coming back again. All of these hopefully will be helpful tools for you as you reach out to our Muslim friends. Thank you, mm -hmm. and God bless everybody. Take care. Mm -hmm.